There is nothing we should be quite so grateful for as the last line of a poem that goes, when your own heart asks, be resolved, young samurai, and tell the world what you witness here today. One may yet live, having lost their life, but never after losing their honor. Some big feels. Yeah. Yeah? Always some big feels. But what does that mean? It's honestly pretty cut and dry. Mm. In, in Rokugan, you can live on after your death, as long as you behaved honorably. But if you were dishonorable and lived a dishonorable life, then sometimes not even death is enough to cleanse the stain of your dishonor. Welcome to our fifth episode explaining Legend of the Five Rings on the It's a Mimic channel. I'm Megan and with me is Roman. You're a shite. <laughs> in this episode, we're going to be diving into three of the great clans that inhabit the Empire of Rokugan in Legend of the Five Rings. So before we, before, let's just precurse this with there are great clans, minor clans, and XYZ. So how many are there of each? <sighs> before, like. There are nine great clans mm -hmm. and a variety of minor clans mm -hmm. um the minor clans are a little bit harder to keep track of i could get you an exact number but they fluctuate right yeah if you do something notable enough like you can be elevated to minor clan status as long as you have enough followers yeah um the great clans all exist because of a celestial patron so at the beginning of the empire, after the fall of the Kami, each of them went out and found followers of their own. Yeah. And that is what formed the original great clans. Now, there are a few of the clans that have been elevated to great clan status, most notably the Mantis and the Spider. Mm -hmm. But that is something that we will discuss during their episodes. That's fair. So this one, we're going to cover three in this one. Yes. Who are we covering first? We are going to be starting with the Lion Clan. After the tournament of the Kami, Okoto, founder of the Lion Clan, went out in search of men and women worthy to stand beside him and protect the Emperor. Where hundreds of others tried, often only one Bushi stood up to Okoto's challenge and succeeded. His bloody search was said to have been criticized in the courts of the Emperor by those who witnessed it, and some proclaimed him a scourge upon the land of Rokugan. Each year during Hante's coronation anniversary, Okoto returned to his brother's palace with no followers or brilliant generals to lead his waiting armies. Led by Ikuma and Kitsu, the Lion Clan grew slowly. Okoto was not satisfied. The Lady Matsu, who was possibly the greatest mortal warrior of the time, had not come to be tested. When he finally convinced her to fight, it is said that the sky and earth had shaken. The Lion Clan are the right hand of the Emperor, recording the military and political interactions between the clans. They are the epitome of Bushido and the very example of valor. Next to the Seppin family, they are the most likely to serve as the Emperor's guardsmen, and they comprise the greater portion of the Imperial Legions. The lion is mostly identified with yellows, browns, and earth tone colors. The lion are the most militant and aggressive of all the clans, revering Bushido and loyalty to the Emperor as life's two most essential governing principles. The lion's rigidity and strict adherence to tradition had made diplomatic relations with other clans very difficult especially the Crane and Scorpion clans. To the Lion, an ancestor was more than simply a spirit of the past. They guided the current generation of Lions in their everyday life and helped shape their destinies. They were more than the clan's past. They were its present and future. The families of the Lion clan are the Okoto, the Ikuma, the Kitsu, and the Matsu. The Okoto and the structure of the Okoto family was extremely clear-cut, and each Okoto knew his place in it. A visiting dragon clan samurai said that the Okoto know how to turn I into we, and that is why they are strong. The family focused on the whole and not the individual. The Okoto's greater strength came from each man considering himself a soldier, part of a bigger group, which led to the Okoto family's motto, duty, honor, leadership, which also defined the three qualities with the greatest value among them. The Ikuma family. In all the time with the lion, the Ikuma had always been historians, recording the great deeds of their fellows, and the ones who kept the records of each battle fought on imperial soil. Although many claimed that they placed too much emphasis on history, it could not be denied that the Ikuma had the most intricate and complete records of the history of the empire. In the beginning, the Ikuma role of historian was an important but minor role of the family. 
which was a family of warriors like the Okoto and the Matsu. The Kitsu family served the lion as lore keepers, mythologists, and diplomats, but their duties were far greater than the typical Shugenja. Like the Ikema family, the Kitsu were keepers of history, but rather than the physical history of the clan, the Kitsu guarded the spiritual history. Thus, the Kitsu's duty was not only to his clan and emperor, but to the many thousands of lion who had come before them. Members of the Okoto family were said to be the brain of the lion, but the Matsu were said to be its heart, for it was the Matsu who charged onto the battlefield and directed the troops. All Matsu were hot-tempered, emotional, strong-willed, and intractable, just like their founder. But they were also highly courageous, loyal, dedicated, and fierce. The Matsu were the epitome of every clan's view of a lion, good and bad. Them's the lions. Those are the lions. <laughs> it's so interesting, like, when we talk about this, we keep saying emperor, because technically within most of the timelines, it's usually an emperor, but I'm so used to playing in the campaign where even empress. Yeah. <laughs> for, for the large history of uh, of the empire it has been an emperor it's mm -hmm. only within the last i want to say two generations that it's been an empress mm -hmm. which is very interesting yeah but yeah i think like, like the cut and dry of it is these are your 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 right hand men to the emperor and then they are the military strong men yeah the yeah. the standing army they're yeah. when i've described them to people in the past they're they're kind of like the spartans yeah you know they're they're a heavy military culture based on lots of tradition and on uh maintaining that group mentality. Yeah. Battlements, army, strategy. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, the whole, like, the, the, the family as a whole, not just the single person or whatever that was. You know? Exactly. Makes sense. Uh, which, family, which family out of those ones inspires you the most? I really like the Okoto. Yeah? Um, because the Okoto, as written, are supposed to be the, the smart guys at the jock table. You know? <laughs> they're, they're the quarterbacks. Right? Yeah. They're the ones calling the plays, they're the ones calling the shots, they're the ones saying, hey, this is where we're going, this is why we're doing it. Um, they're, they're tacticians, yeah. and uh, I find them to be more interesting than um, a lot of the other Bushi in the Empire, because they are very intelligence-based, as opposed to just going out and hitting things. Mm -hmm. um, what was the family that did like the history, the Ikuma? Uh, there are the Ikuma and the Kitsu. Again, the Ikuma are concerned with like the political and military history where yeah. the kitsu are concerned with the spiritual history yeah the ikuma are the ones that kind of interest me the most a little bit yeah i've never once in my life played a lion i've never like <laughs> i've never really interacted with a lion to be honest with you but i do enjoy the idea of the keepers of history and then the um corruption that comes with therein however the lions are more along the lines of honor so it's like they would be the ones that would be most accurate about who wins, who loses, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. It would take a great amount of corruption to corrupt that history. Yeah. Right? And so that interests me a lot. Because I did play a lot, again, I played a lot in a Phoenix Clan game where they are history keepers. They keep notes. They keep books. But it's, they keep what everything was written. Anything that was written, they keep, basically. Yeah. The biggest library on the planet lives there. And so you will probably find multiple versions of history within that library. I feel like their documentation will be the most accurate. You can correct me if I'm wrong. No, I mean, it'll be the most accurate to the lion. Fair because enough. again, the, the Ikuma and the Kitsu aren't concerned with the history of the empire at large. They're concerned with the history of the lion. Yeah. So they focus their things on cool things that the lion have done and important things that have happened in the lion clan. They don't really care about what happens to the dragon or the crane. That's fair. I feel like that could be said for most clans that maintain their own histories and lines. With the exception of the phoenix. Yeah. No. But I think that would be very interesting that if you were to be like, yes, I want to find this information on this battle that once happened with some with and lions were involved you would almost want to go to the lions and be like this is where i'm going to find the most accurate information yeah 100 percent. yeah hmm. how would you play a character from this clan most of the time when i play lions i play them kind of lawful stupid <laughs> um well you said they're the jocks right yeah but it's it's not <laughs> again like i said that well oh, my favorite lion family is the akoto because they're because <laughs> they got brain and then i play all of my lions smooth brain but it's it's more so blinded by their traditions and blinded by their desire to hold fast to those traditions than it is true stupidity. Yeah. It's, I know that it is my responsibility to answer this challenge with blood, even if I would rather not. Yeah. But I'm going to do it. Fair enough. Yeah. How about you? How would you play a lion? Uh, I, the hard part that I feel is, like, I make a lot of correlations between, unfortunately, with Game of Thrones. Yeah. And when you think lion in Game of Thrones, you immediately think of Jamie Lannister. <laughs> And weirdly enough, I feel like he would make a really good lion. I think Jamie would be an excellent lion. Yes. 
And like he was a dishonorable man for many, many reasons, but he was very true to his clan and very honorable to his house. Yeah. Right. And I feel like that embodies what a lion would end up being at some point. Like it, it is, it is one interpretation of what could happen to lions. And I think in the world of, of Westeros and in the world of Game of Thrones, like Jamie is a hundred percent what a lion would be like in that setting. But he does remind me of a lawful stupid jock, He's so I feel like it fits the bill. So lawful stupid. But if I was to play a lion, unfortunately, that's how I would play it. Yeah. And that's what I would do. 100%. Yeah. You know, fuck my sister and have a nice time. Wow. <laughs> Megan. Well, I mean... <laughs> we don't do that anymore. <laughs> She's attractive. What do you want? Oh, my God. <laughs> As a storyteller, how do you fit this clan into your narrative? I usually use lions as a moral compass. Fair enough. Right? They, I, I put them in a position where that honor is being tested, and I make everybody watch. And I have the rest of the table decide whether they think this person is being smart or stupid. Mm -hmm. And use it to sort of gauge their morality. Because if the lion are the epitome of Bushido, if they are true north, then wherever anybody else decides to stand is going to give you a great metric of how they're intending on playing their character mm -hmm. publicly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not only that, but I feel like if you were in a situation in any other land or any other clan scenario and a group of lions showed up, that's your precursor to that the emperor is involved in what you are doing. Yeah. Like, that's a good sign that if you're in some other, somewhere doing whatever you're doing and all of a sudden you see an, a battlement or a small, like, tiny little army of lion hanging around, something is going down that has to do with the empire, which means you're probably dealing with a situation that is larger than what you are currently dealing with. Yeah. Because I feel like they would not send them if it wasn't for a larger purpose. Well, the the emperor doesn't typically send the lion places, but when things endanger the emperor or the empress, yeah. the lion rock up. Yes, they're, they're again the first line of defense, in like quote unquote, in my mind. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Like you're not gonna see the empress or the emperor or their immediate folk ro like rocking up to your party. It's probably gonna be the lion first. Yeah. So if you have to have an interaction with the lion, that's your precursor. That's your like your clue that you're dealing with a larger issue. Hell yeah. So that's how I would play them and and intervention. Like, and it could be an intervention. If you are about to start a war by accident as a group, I feel like the lion would be like, hold up. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, if, like if, if your party is actively fucking up and potentially going to start a war somewhere close to where the, like, the emperor and the empress are, you're going to see a group of lion and be like, hmm. <laughs> You should stop what you're doing. I wonder what these guys are doing here. They're not <laughs> normally in this part of town. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. It's like the whole thing. All of a sudden you see a parade of like gold and like, again, earth tones just running through the city. And you're like, on best behavior for the next 24 hours, perhaps? Love me a good earth tone. <laughs> All right, who are we talking about next? The next clan that we're speaking about is the Phoenix. Mm. The most important event in the history of the Phoenix clan was when Sheba knelt before the mortal Izawa, casting away his pride and arrogance and promising to protect his people in exchange for Izawa's help in ending the war against Fu Lang by becoming the Phoenix clan Thunder. Until this point, the tribe of Izawa had been part of the Phoenix only because geographically, their land was within the area granted to Sheba by Hante. Izawa refused to acknowledge the rule of the Kami, but also refused to leave his lands. Shiva protected him from the Emperor's wrath by claiming that the Izawa were part of his own clan, even though Izawa would have claimed otherwise. Mm. Izawa had believed that the war would not affect his people because it was confined to southern Rokugan. And if he remained neutral, the Dark Kami would leave his people alone. When the forces of his Shadowlands began attacking the Izawa lands in the far north of the Empire, Izawa too realized that he could not remain neutral in the war, and that if he tried, his people would be destroyed. Izawa then offered to help Shiva in defeating the, his corrupt brother, but only on the condition that Shiba would kneel before him as he offered his fealty. Izawa would not have his people believing that he had sold them into bondage to Akami. Shiba, realizing the opportunity before him, did not hesitate to kneel before Izawa and to protect his family once he was gone. The Phoenix clan are known throughout Rokugan for their skilled Shugenja and mastery of elemental magic. The Phoenix are also noted pacifists, preferring diplomacy to war if at all possible. The Phoenix presence in the courts of the land is not as great as the courtiers are relatively few though they are not isolationists like the Dragon Clan. The Phoenix Clan was founded by the Kami Shiba, 
while the family of his vassal Izawa generally run the affairs of the clan. The phoenix are mostly identified with red, yellow, and orange colors. They are the mystics and philosophers who seek enlightenment, but the clan also seeks to ensure their position as the controllers of magical knowledge within the empire. With three of the four phoenix families studying the elements, it is hardly surprising that they have been widely recognized in this area by the rest of Rokugan. This attitude has a detrimental side in that the other clans often see the phoenix as being arrogant and disinterested, as having a more intimate knowledge of the kami and their ways. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Like, it's fair, but I feel like they come across as arrogant not on purpose. Like, if you think of a social construct in that way, I feel like it's unfair. But at the same time, it's like, no, you would sound like a pompous asshole just for being full of information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the families of the Phoenix are uh, the Agasha, the Asako, the Azawa, and the Shiba. After Togashi died fighting Fulang in the second day of thunder, Miramoto Hitomi took the leadership of the clan. Hitomi was being driven mad by the influence of Onotangu, Lord Moon and began killing all the followers of Togashi who refused to take her name instead. <laughs> die amongst die. The great majority of the Agasha family saw her madness and refused to take part in her destruction of her own clan. They left the traitor of Satomi and joined the Phoenix clan, who lost a great number of their own Shugenja during the clan wars. The Agasha knelt before Shida Sukune. Within a week, less than ten Agasha stood with the dragon. They had been given what was essentially the least productive and desirable of the Shiba provinces. So I, I would say that, like, so far that's one of the first ones we've seen where a clan has jumped ship. And it's not the last. Yes. The Asako family had two major goals. The first was the preservation of knowledge. Shiba had informed Asako that the preservation of history was vital for the development of mankind. As for progress to be made, mankind must know what events have come before. To this end, the Asako were one of the foremost families of historians and librarians in Rokugan. The Asako strove to find every tale, story, and myth, compiling them into a comprehensive history. They were considered some of the greatest historians of Rokugan. The second goal was the evolution of mankind itself. To this end, the Asako Henshin did their best to guide the rest of Rokugan along the path of man. The Henshin traveled Rokugan as ordinary monks, quietly and discreetly guiding those that would listen in what they believed to be the path to divinity. The Azawa saw themselves as the protectors of all that was arcane within Rokugan. They hunted for Maho. They sought out unknown Nemurani and other artifacts. They sought knowledge lost to time. They attempted to learn all that there was to be known about magic from all of the clans. Izawa students were not an uncommon sight in the schools around the empire, studying under the sensei of other clans. The Shiba. The primary duty of the Shiba was to protect the Izawa family. At the dawn of the empire, Shiba made this promise to Izawa, and his descendants have been driven to fulfill it ever since. That promise is what the Shiba took as their defining purpose, and it is what gives them strength and unity. Which family inspires you the most? I'm a big fan of the Shiba. Mm -hmm. The idea that you were founded by a god who decided that it was more important to cast his pride aside, yeah. to kneel to a mortal for the good of the empire, like that really appeals to me. Yeah. Their role as being... That, there, there's, a, there's a cool story within the lore where sometimes Shiba armies will show up to conflicts, and they'll just post up in between two armies that are getting ready to square off and just defend the middle of the battlefield yeah. on two fronts to stop fights from breaking out. Mm -hmm. And, like, that sort of a mentality and those sorts of, like, ways of dealing with conflict, I find really interesting. Yeah. Like, I'm personally drawn... I'm drawn to the Asawa just because, like, most of my... My most recent favorite character ended up marrying into the family, and that's what kind of inspired my campaign. But I actually, in the researching, ended up liking the Asako family. Mostly because, yes, they are historians, and yes, they are driven to find out information, but I kind of, in my mind, see them as being hyper-fixated. So when you're building an Asako, you can kind of say, yeah, I, I, I search for all this knowledge, I want to know all things, but you can definitely hyper-fixate on what it is that you are extremely knowledgeable about. Yeah. So, and when we get into, like, later on in our series about when we talk about, like, building and developing your, your PCs and your characters, there are different stats you can take for specific types of lore. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that that can really drive the backstory of your character when it comes to that family. Because they would be driven to, like, know everything about this one thing. And then that would be their defining feature and what they are good at. and what. So if you were going to seek out someone to help you with a very specific issue, like if you're dealing with randomly undead or you're dealing with the Shadowlands, you're dealing with this, you might seek out an Asako that was very hyper fixated on that and is the professional in that information. Yeah, if, if you're in that part of the Empire, you have a, a Phoenix contact, Yeah, that would 100% be a good way of, uh, of finding that information you're looking for. Yeah, and I find that they would be very... <sighs> 
they would have their very specific stance on things. And this is where I feel like the arrogance comes into play sometimes, is they would have read all of the histories, decide that this is the right and or wrong ruling into the situation, and they would hold fast to that. Yeah, no, nothing you can tell me I haven't already read. I've made up my mind. Yeah, it's like the whole sitting at the table, like... <laughs> The emperor sucks. Change my mind. Like <laughs> you can't. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, we don't say that. That's how we get executed. <laughs> That's how we. You want to die? That's how you die. Uh, but I feel like they're a very, very interesting character type to role play, um, especially when you come from the Phoenix Clan that are thought in the Empire to sometimes come across as arrogant. I think this is the clan that would come across as the most arrogant. So is that how you would play a Phoenix? You play your Phoenix as arrogant. Depends on what family I play them in. Like Asako, yes, I would play them as arrogant. Yeah. And like well well versed in one topic. Yeah. But then everything else they just talk out of their ass because they have so many social skills. Yeah. Ma masters of one. Yes. Um but if I was to play in Azawa, again, it's the pacifist I would I would lean into of the I will hear out everything you have to say and I won't judge you. Yeah. But this is the correct answer. But it, they wouldn't come across as arrogant. They would just come across as knowledgeable and caring. Very matter of fact. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How would you role play? Uh, most of the time when I play Phoenix, I try and play them as being generally helpful. Yeah. You know, th there's that inquisitiveness of, oh, that, that thing that you want to figure out? Well, now I want to figure it out, too. <laughs> right? Like, oh, you're looking for a MacGuffin? Like, hell yeah, let's go find this MacGuffin. <laughs> let's find the MacGuffin. <laughs> um, and the sheep is just following them around like, ah, more MacGuffins. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I play the, the non-combative Phoenix as if they are there to help. They, they want to know as much as you want to know because now there's a question in the back of their head. Yeah. Right? Um, whereas the... Because I believe the Asako have a monk family. Yeah. And the... Yeah, the Shiba are, of course, they're Pushi. I play them more along the lines of we have to make our way to the end of this so that we can come home from this. Yeah. Right? Well, let's come home alive. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's always that extra level of caution, that extra, almost like a like a helicopter parent. Yeah. Yeah. I remember having a really good conversation with our resident uh, Phoenix, well, one of our resident Phoenix, um, where my character was very much a, well, if, if battle and killing people is necessary, I will do it. And he was like, no, we don't fight for anything. Like, we, if we can bring peace, we bring peace. And they taught each other a lesson throughout, like... She learned to be more peaceful, and he learned to be more, slightly more aggressive when necessary. Yeah, he learned that there there is a time to fight, and yeah. that sometimes there is no response other than combat. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that was an interesting, like, thing to role play through in your character development. And that was, a in my mind, a solid representation of different clan realities coming together and making a solution. Mm-hmm. But as a storyteller, how do you feel, how do you fit this clan specifically into your narrative? I love using them as uh, quest givers yeah. or like information brokers. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily like, hey, you're going to pay me for this, but oh yeah, I need help dusting all of the books in this library. And if you take an afternoon to help me do that, I will be more than happy to help you find the book that you're looking for. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I use them as the quest givers in my campaign. Yeah. And, like, yeah. that was supposed to be it. It wasn't supposed to be a full Phoenix game. They were just supposed to be the quest givers that said, yep, this is the thing we need to do because we are honorable folk and this is what we want to do. And then it ended up being a hell of a lot more within the Phoenix clan that I anticipated. Because brought, brought it upon yourself. I did. But uh, they are definitely those people that know more about the Empire just just out of, like, because they, I feel like they are present in almost every court. There will be a Phoenix there. Yeah. Because they are interested in the histories of the Empire and what is affecting the Empire as a whole from all directions and all aspects. Mm -hmm. So I feel like no matter what court you go to, there will probably be a Phoenix there, unless they are specifically disinvited. The next family that we're going to talk about, mm -hmm. you can guarantee, will be at every court. 100%. And that's the Crane. Yeah. The Crane were founded by the Kami Doji, and they pursued excellence in all things. The traditions established by Lady Doji were now customary in the Emperor's court. The formal dueling system, Yaijutsu, was established by Doji's husband, Kikita. Their preferential status with the imperial line was renowned, and throughout history, the clans had fewer taxes and more gifts heaped upon them. Mm -hmm. They were the masters of the courts, and had the status and wealth commensurate with such a position. The crane colors were mostly identified with sky blue and silver. 
the Crane Clan are the left hand of the Emperor, and known throughout Rokugan for its still duelists and artisans. The Crane were also noted courtiers, wielding great power in the courts of the land. Crane are both respected and hated by other clans. None, however, could dispute their economic importance to the Empire, essentially keeping the Empire going. The Crane have attempted to keep relationships smooth with all the clans, despite what they might actually feel towards some of them. The families of the Crane are the Asahina, the Daidoji, the Doji, and the Kikita. The Asahina family was the Shugenji family of the clan. The Asahina family was the Shugenja family of the Crane clan. They were also noted pacifists, and their beliefs often led to them being less involved in matters of clan and imperial politics than other families of the Crane. Izawa Asahina forsook the use of fire when he forswore violence and joined the Crane. He turned his talents to air, the element of healing instead, and now it is common for many Asahina to Shugenja to use this element. The Daidoji family were the support troops of the Crane, renowned throughout the Empire for their unusual tactics and stubborn defense of the Crane lands. They trained the Yojimbo used by the Crane dignitaries, and their Harriers were the elite force that most samurai, even within the Crane, did not even know existed. They also contributed the most men to the rank and file of the Crane armies, the Daidoji Iron Warriors. The Doji family were the descendants of the children of Doji and Kikita who took their mother's name. They were the champions of the Crane, and are frequently, though not exclusively, the Emerald Champions as well. The Doji hosted the Crane's courtier and magistrate schools, although many of their number trained in the Kikita schools as well. The Kikita, the style of Kikita, became the famed Kikita Iaijutsu school, and he passed on his knowledge to any who had the ability and discipline to learn. He created the first dojo, and taught his students the way of honorable combat. All of his five children excelled at dueling, and his son, Kikita Shimizu, became the first Iaijutsu master of the Kikita Dueling Academy. <laughs> Amazing. Right? <laughs> Which family speaks to you in this one? I love me a Kikita. I, I, I was going to say I wanted a Kikita. And it's mostly because we don't talk about dueling a lot. Like, yeah. Because, um, like, again, we, I think, did we speak about it in our episodes where, like, dueling is can be utilized to, like, solve an issue? Well, well dueling is primarily used to resolve legal issues. I, I keep forgetting that we had this argument, weirdly enough, at a party about whether or not dueling was yes. an acceptable form of... <laughs> <laughs> solving a problem um but i i think that it's it's neat that their school is very primarily focused on that aspect yeah because dueling is a lot more complicated than than we think it is because i remember when i started to dig into the mechanics of actually doing a duel it's not just roll a dice and you win or lose like there's steps to doing a duel yeah both like role-playing steps and mechanical steps yeah to like what encompasses a duel and so it, it's it's funny that you s said that like you know the Kikita duelists yeah. are what you like about the Kikita. There is another Kikita school, the Kikita Jester, and their whole thing is that their style of comedy, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. is just shitting on people. <laughs> and so if you have a Kikita Jester that rocks up to you at a court and they sort of sarcastically say things about you in front of people, like airing your dirty laundry, you can't really say anything to them about it because it is their job. <laughs> and that's what I like about the Kikita. The Kikita duelists are sweet, but they're the second best duelists in the Empire. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well it's just the first time we've really talked about dueling you know as what? like a whole. You're right. And you know what? If you want to fight me in the comments about the crane being better than the dragon at dueling, like, you know where to find me. <laughs> I'm sorry, are the crane better than the dragon at dueling? No, they're really not. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that your stance was known to the internet. Well, my, my stance is 100% biased. That's fair. You are a dragon at heart. I ain't afraid of no Kikita. <laughs> So would the the school where it's the jester, would they be considered courtiers or would they be considered bushi? They are a courtier. Courtier. Yeah. Okay. Got you. That would make more sense. I'm just imagining someone standing there with a sword being an asshole and it's like, okay. <laughs> no, I'm going to fight you. Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a thing that happens when you run your mouth. <laughs> so don't run your mouth. Hey man, talk shit, get hit. <laughs> uh, how would you play a character from this clan? It really varies based on family and the, school. The families are very different in this clan. Yes. Yeah. Like the most of the time when you're playing a crane bushi, if you are a formalized duelist or a magistrate, you are either super cocky mm -hmm. because you know you're good or you're very professional yeah. because you know you're good. 
Yeah. The courtiers can range anywhere from, hey, I heard you were looking for this thing. I'm happy to find it for you. To, it would be a terrible thing if this party that you're planning was attended by no one. Right? They will always be courteous. Yeah. They will always be polite with you. It doesn't mean that they're above threatening you. No. <laughs> Or putting you in your place or embarrassing you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, they Again, they try their best not to embarrass you because, again, preserving on is an important thing. It's important for them as much as it's important for you. But they will make sure that everybody is aware of the fact that they are doing you a solid mm -hmm. because that's what Crane do. Yeah. <laughs> I could embarrass you here, but I'm not going to, just so you know. Just so you're aware. <laughs> I'm aware that I could bury your family alive right now, but I'm not going to. But just remember this kindness and do not mistake my kindness for kindness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a storyteller, how do you fit this clan into your narrative? I like using cranes as a bit of a roadblock. Mm -hmm. There's something that the party needs to get done, but there's a crane with conflicting goals. Yeah. It could be something as simple as, hey, I understand that you need to get through this way, but we have a parade planned. <laughs> and you're not getting through. No, 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 no. Like, there's a dude on the other side of this. Like, he's getting away. Yeah, that's nice. You're not getting through. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Romans, we don't fight <laughs> during this season. You're going to have to wait. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I use them as roadblocks. I like using my benevolent cranes as, again, party homies. Yeah. Like... Oh yeah, I know a guy. He's great. And then they rock up and, oh, it is, it's Doji so-and-so. He's, um, you know, one, one of the courtiers who has done all of these philanthropic things within the city. He would be happy to help you with this thing, right? Like, the, the Crane have such a wide range of roles that they can fill because they kind of have their fingers in everything. Yeah, no. And I said, like, again, each family is very distinctly different. So you would utilize each family in a very different scenario. Mm -hmm. And so I find that they're a very opportunistic family that you can place in almost any situation. You will find them at courts. You will find them in war. You will find them on battlements. You will find them anywhere. Yes. Like, they will just be there. So, like, to your point at the beginning of the conversation of Crane, if you're going to a, go to a court, you will probably see a Crane. Oh, you, you will definitely. There is at least one Crane at <laughs> one the One hanging right? out. Just like, what's up? <laughs> no Bushi. Just sitting there. Like, I can do this myself. I don't need anyone to protect me. <laughs> hey, you need favors? I got favors. Want to buy a sundial? Like, yeah. You want to buy a sundial? You don't want to get embarrassed? <laughs> <laughs> you let me know. <laughs> <sighs> All right, well, that's pretty much the three families we're going to talk about today. But one of the cool things about Rokugani society is the importance placed on clothing. So I think that because we just talked about our first three family clans, yeah, it's good to speak about, like, what clothing means to them. Well, so... the, one of the major functions of clothing is identifying yourself within yeah. the empire, right? If you're wearing, wearing a super nice kimono, then people will know that you come from money. People will know that you are well-established and that you have a, a wealthy lord or patron. Uh, your kimono bears your clan moan, which is the heraldry of the empire. Mm -hmm. um, depending on the placement of your clan moan, that determines what is important to you. So typically, moan are placed uh, over the left side of your chest, the right side of your chest, and then on your back. Yeah. Right? And then, uh, so the left side is what guides your heart. The right side is what guides your actions. Mm -hmm. And then your back is, again, usually what you use to represent, like, what you're repping, right? So... It's your jersey number, you know? Kind of. <laughs> right? Like, most folk will just rock their clan mon. Yeah. Right? Some other people, if they feel like their position in a certain, um... The social structure or uh, organization is really important. They'll rock that on the back of their kimono. Yeah. But it all depends on what you define as being most important to you. Uh, just for those of you who are not in the know, the kimono is a robe-like, full-sleeved garment. Uh, in summer, the Rokugani wear light silk kimonos, and in winter, they wear heavier padded kimonos made of cotton. A sash, called an obi, is worn about the waist with pleats that serve as pockets. The daisho, which is the two swords of the samurai, are typically tucked under the obi. A hakama, which is kind of like a pleated divided skirt, is worn over the kimono and used in formal occasions. Mm -hmm. The original purpose of the kimono uh, was a light armor because it catches arrows. They get all bundled up in the silk and uh, 
silk slows bleeding. Interesting. Right? What the fuck? Fun facts. <laughs> the more you know. Yeah. Uh, a more formal kimono will have multiple layers. Yeah. So your standard level of formality is like kimono, pants, maybe a haori, which is like the jacket that goes over it. Yeah. If you were going to a formal coat, it could be like a three to four layer kimono. If you're getting married, it can go up to seven. Mm -hmm. So depending on what level of formality and what level of importance of the event, you'll just wear more clothes on top of your clothes. So many more. <laughs> Each layer is sequentially more shiny than the other one. <laughs> oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because kimono aren't cheap. No. And being able to wear multiple layers of this gorgeous thing represent that you are somebody with wealth and status. Yeah. I mean, I, I've made one before in my cro cosplaying life. Ooh. Yeah. I made a yukata, which is basically just like the basic bare bones, like every day kimono. Yeah. Summer kimono. Yeah. With like the, the obi and everything with it. It was a lot, right? It was a lot. <laughs> and that was for one fucking layer. <laughs> <laughs> How would you place your own clan mon? Sword side, sword side, like heart side, back of the kimono. Or would you do all? Well, so so fun fact about uh, about Roman. Um, I have my clan mon tattooed on my chest. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so over my over my sword hand, so on the the right side of my chest, I have the imperial family's mon. Yeah. Uh, it is a chrysanthemum, and it is to remind me of my loyalty to my family. Mm. and to act with my family, be they chosen or otherwise, in mind. Um, over my heart, I have the Dragon Clan Mon, which is to remind me to be sincere and be true to my feelings. Uh, I don't have any Clan Mon on my back, but if I was to throw some Clan Mon up on my back, it'd probably be a big old <clears throat> Dragon Clan Mon again. Again, if we're just talking about, like, um, like kimono, mm. as opposed to... You know, tattoos on my skin. Because it's not like I'm going to throw a big dragon clan one on my back now that I have one on my chest. Oh but, my god. Could you imagine? Uh, I, I can, and we're, I'm just not going to... Fair enough. Yeah. I accept. No. How but, about you? <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about tattoos, the one over my heart right now is an egg. <laughs> okay, I mean, we're not talking about tattoos. We're talking about clan moan. <laughs> I mean, like, okay, so if I was to be, like, a samurai of Rokugan and I had to, like, decide one placement for it and I had to choose between the three, I would put it over my heart for sure. But I would probably do, I want to say Dragon Clan because, like, I identify with them the most, um, but not necessarily how I live my life, Yeah. if that makes sense. Like, I identify with the spirit of them, I identify with, like, I, the life, lives that they choose to lead and, like, We'll talk about the Dragon Clan on, like, another episode, but um, the Phoenix lately have, like, really drawn me in. And I feel like there was a secondary timeline where I was a Phoenix. There's also a secondary timeline where I was a Crane. So it just depends. Yeah. <laughs> depends on the day for Moomies. Um, but, yeah, no. I don't know if I could dedicate myself to one family, and I think that's where I would be problematic. I'd be like, if I'm going to be rebirthed, I want to be rebirthed into a different family to see this different perspective of life. Yeah. So. That's a, <laughs> you know what? That's a, that's, a, that's a phoenix way of looking at things. Isn't that weird? Yeah. How that works of, out that way? Not that weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which piece of Rokugani clothing would you wear in your everyday life if you could? Uh, Hauri. Yeah. 100%. Because Hauri is pretty inconspicuous. It's like a light coat. Yeah. That I could wear over all of my other stuff. And then, you know, it, it would be great for summertime, just keeping the sun off my arms. Because yeah. uh, in spite of being a melanated individual, I burn like nobody's <laughs> business. So uh, I 100% the Howry. The, the Hakama is something that I have worn, especially as a martial artist. Like, it's just a part of the, the getup. Mm -hmm. um, but I am uh, not super graceful in it. I think the, the Howry is something that I could rock on a daily basis and uh, just make it all part of my fashion statement. How yeah. about you? I would wear a Wakazashi and that's it. Oh, okay. I mean, <laughs> it's it's not a part of the... Okay. You it's know what? Never mind. Of, it is, it's tucked right into the OB, but I would just wear the Wakazashi and that's it. Respectable. Yeah. <laughs> Megan likes swords. Got it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we stab, we kill, and that's how she lived. Yikes. <laughs> So out of these three families that we just talked about, the three clans that we yeah. just spoke of, uh, which was the... The lion, the phoenix, the crane. The lion, the phoenix, and the crane. Which of these three speaks to you the most? Out of these three only. 
out of these three. Because your bias is fucked to dragon. I can't tell you. Ask what your favorite clan is. No, no, no. no so no. out of these three, which one is your favorite? Okay, so like, so my best friends are cranes. It's fair. And so that informs my bias in a big way. Yeah. Like I, I have two phenomenal cranes in my life who. In spite of being, like, I met them both at very different times in my life, mm-hmm. and they both came to become cranes in very different ways. Yeah. They are so similar in so many ways. They are always very courteous, very helpful, will do everything in their power to be like, hey man, you look hungry, let's go grab a bite. Hey man, I heard you were going through a thing, let's talk this out. Um, one of them I've known since I was in grade two, and one of them I, I only met like a couple years ago. And the both of them have informed my personal opinion on Crane, which makes me feel really bad whenever I play a Crane, like, kind of shitty. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to play this Crane as a villain, or I'm going to play this Crane as a dickhead. Uh, please forgive me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> please, please forgive me. How about you? Uh, so, I mean, I am biased towards the Phoenix at this point, just uh-huh. because of how much I've been involved in their lives lately. But weirdly enough, I feel like I have a lot of lying in my life. Yeah. And that's just because of the the, the business and the work that I do. Everyone is hyper-organized, very team-focused. The collective is more important than the individual. And, like, that kind of speaks to me when I started, like, reading into them and looking into them. I was kind of like, I do, weirdly enough, have a lot of lying in my life. But never thought about it that way because I've never actually looked at the lion as a whole. Yeah, like we we typically gravitate towards the clans that are immediately interesting to us. Yeah. So the, the ones that we identify with and then the ones that our friends identify with. Mm-hmm. And in our immediate circle of friends, we don't have a lot of lions. Yeah, but I operate in leadership roles and have, have operated in leadership roles my entire life. Yeah. So I work with a lot of very strong, independent women, men, leaders, what have you. And they're very opinionated and very strong-willed and all about the collective and Mm. making everyone's lives easier through the structure of organization. Surrounded by lions. Surrounded by lions. And, like, project managers? Lions. (laughs) Uh Yeah, they definitely sons and daughters of Okoto. Yeah. (laughs) And again, there's probably another world where I was probably a lion at some point. (laughs) <laughs> one of my favorite conversations that I've had with, with buddies is, like, in the alternate universe, which clan would you have been in? Yeah. Because there is an alternate universe where I'm not a dragon. I'm a scorpion. Yeah. And, like, that is its own story. There's an alternate universe where my, my good buddy is not a crane. He's a mantis. Mm-hmm. So an alternate universe where my other buddy is not a crane. He's a lion. Yeah. Right? And what has always made L5R so appealing and so interesting to me is that it's always been about your choice. Yes. Right? Your clan, your choice. Your story, your choice. Yeah. Well, like, even when I was starting to DM, like, GM, and, like, I was going into it, um, one of the things we talked about was definitely having conversation like, even though I was pigeonholing my players into only being able to play within four clans, we still wanted to have the conversation of, even though we are only going to be playing in these four, let's do these questions to find out what clan actually you identify with as a person. Yeah. Because that's like your first introduction into L5R as a whole is making that personalized connection to what family you are from. Yeah. Cause, and I think that's the thing that 100% pulls it away from D&D. Because D&D is what is the coolest character I can make, what are the best numbers I can pull, uh, what is the weirdest combination I can create. And that is what D&D is built for, is to be openly creative, that it really almost pulls you out of the personalization of it. L5R is about that connection. Yes. It is about finding the stories that you want to like live out and act out and make them a part of who and what you are yeah. because they're already a part of who and what you are. Yeah. And I think the other beautiful part of it is, again, you can identify with any clan, period. Totally. There's going to be something within the families, the histories, how they operate, and their spirits that is going to speak to you. So even if you identify, to your point, like you dragon... Me, dragon, at first, and now I'm finding that I'm like, oh, that could be a thousand other things. But that's just the way my brain works. Uh, You can find something in any clan that you identify with. So even if you go into another campaign and you're like, okay, well, I don't really want to play dragon because all I do is play dragon. You can suddenly be like, okay, well, let's read a little bit about the crane and see what's happening. There will be something that hooks you. Yeah. Because it will personally speak to you. The the high-level bit of degeneracy is when you decide that you're going to start playing... (sighs) samurai of one clan as samurai of another clan mm-hmm. so when you start playing your cranes like mantis yeah. or when you start playing your crabs like phoenix mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. when you start playing those characters against the grain in those ways, or you write a character for a specific clan and then say, okay, so how would this character work or exist within a different clan? And that's when you start getting these really interesting mashups of people, these complex and diverse characters. Yeah. Well, because I remember that I built... In the first campaign that I played in that when I came back to L5R with you folks was I built a wolf, which is a homebrew clan that you made. Yep. Um, and But she spent a lot of time with the Mantis mm-hmm. in her downtime. So a lot of her fighting styles and personalities actually came from working with the Mantis. And it was sad, sad backstory. She was orphaned and her mother was a Mantis at one point in her life. And, but like... So, but that was the interesting combination was that she was trained in a certain way and trained how to conduct herself in a certain way, but there were social aspects to her that came from another clan. Yeah. And that was interesting to portray and try and navigate how best to make those decisions. Cause like, you're going to make your decisions for your clan and your family, but with the understanding that there are clans that would potentially think otherwise. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's when those kind of interesting political decisions come into play when you're deciding how to have, like, have that tit for tat with another player. Yeah, I agree. So, any other final thoughts or inspirations on these three clans? No, I think I think we hit it all, right? Yeah, man. Without going into like too many more details. <laughs> to the nitty gritties, I guess like it's it's kind of hard to describe how to build a character with these clans because there's so many small little nuances that go with each clan we could literally do an episode per clan and be able to fill it yeah because each clan from a stat building process like which we'll get into later in the series we actually talk about building characters um each clan will of course give you different benefits benefits and bonuses and disadvantages based on what family you come from yes each each family provides a numerical value Yes. That will determine, you know, your your stats. Yes. Right? And each school does the same thing. Right? Yeah. So depending on which combination of family and school, it entirely changes the character. Yeah. Right? From a stats wise perspective. From a stats perspective. It's not just about like, I am gonna be a crane and I'm gonna be a nice, courteous human being. No, it actually gives you stats towards that direction. Yeah, that's correct. Like so that's something to keep in mind like as we go through this that we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty details and numbers of it, just more along the details of, like, how you would role-play a character, right? 100%. But. Because that makes it more system agnostic. Yeah, it's true. It's, and boring. <laughs> <laughs> numbers, numbers, dice, dice, dice. <laughs> so that's all for today's episode in this series on Legend of the Five Rings. Make sure to like and comment in which of the great clans you would like to play your first game of L5R. Or actually just look into what clan you identify with the most. Don't forget to follow or subscribe because in the next episode we will continue to delve into the great clans of the Emerald Empire. For more info and details, please check the show notes. When you're resolved from the beginning, you will not be perplexed. This understanding extends to everything. Be resolved, young samurai, and tell the world what you have witnessed here today.